Um, so I just wanted to say welcome to day two of the DevCon. And uh, this morning, let me see. Uh, oh, you got you got your slide up already. Good. WebKit Dev Environment Setup. So this is a. I, I call it the. Uh, I call it personally. I'm just say personally. I call it the Amiga um, browser development team, but they're far more um, reserved. These guys. But uh, they're going to talk about the the nuts and bolts on how we, how we get closer and closer to an actual web browser. So, <laughs> you can uh, take it away there, George. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Steve, uh, thanks everyone for being here. I didn't realize that my presentation is going to be the first one for the second day, and uh, I expect that most of you are still having some hangover. So, if uh, what I'm going to present to you is uh, too technical or too boring, please uh, start me and uh, let me know. Um, I would like to, to have this presentation as much uh, interactive as possible. So, at any point, please let me know. If you have any questions, I would uh, love to, to explain everything to you. Uh, so, uh, let me start. I hope that my slides are looking much better than last year, uh, based on the, the, the coloring. Uh, so, my name is uh, George Sekanos. I'm a software engineer coming from uh, Greece, uh, but right now I'm living in uh, Dublin, Ireland. And um, in the Amiga forums, and almost everywhere, I'm known as uh, Volcano. Uh, I'm a beta tester for uh, as much things as possible in the Amiga world, so Amiga OS 4, Amiga OS 3, and a lot of hardware from Aeon, uh, as well as uh, Enhancer. And I'm a um, system administrator and developer to a few of uh, our beloved uh, websites, like the Amiga's.net uh, forum or the os 4 coding.net. Uh, actually, about the OS4 coding, sorry, about the OS4 coding.net, uh, that was something that was an idea I had uh, a long time ago, and I focused that to OS4 because I had some discussion with Stephen about that, and we were discussing about if we should uh, do a generic uh, forum or a, a more focused forum for OS4. And uh, that's what uh, I decided, that's why it is named like that. Uh, also, uh, the last years I uh, got, uh, I worked on the Amiga OS 4 SDK. I, I'm uh, delighted to say that I helped uh, the last two SDKs to be released. And uh, I hope to see more uh, and work on more uh, SDK releases in the future. Um, I'm, you might know my application with the Apple or the Light Excel uh, editor, which, we are, uh, which is for uh, development, and uh, a lot of others that I am involved, uh, including some uh, game boards. Um, so, what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'd love to, to show you something like a web keyboard being done and a minimal uh, browser running on my system, uh, but unfortunately I don't have something like that. Uh, instead of that, I'm going to talk to you how uh, I'm doing with uh, the team that we work on together uh, on web keyboard or other uh, uh, topics that uh, Ryan is going to describe uh, and talk about uh, later in the next uh, presentation. Um, but I'm going to tell you uh, about the development environment that I like to use on my system and why I believe that is uh, something that more people can use uh, for developing for Amiga OS 4 and also for uh, developing different applications and not only for the web keyboard. The web keyboard is a good, huge uh, project that can test uh, all the tool chain that we have right now using cross compiling and that's what I'm going to talk to you uh, today. Also I'm going to do some uh, research demos that I hope to that I hope they are going to work just fine. 
And I'm going also to discuss about automation and uh, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, things that are uh, already applied in this project and um, can be useful for other projects as well. So, um, I guess you all know what WebKit uh, 40 is all about. Um, it's the heart and the soul for a browser, but on, not only for that, uh, mail clients can use it, applications, other applications can use it. Uh, and it is um, necessary for us because we don't have an up-to-date web browser right now that most of the people uh, request from any operating system. Uh, it is huge and complicated. Uh, many times I was thinking if I am that full to get myself involved in that, this kind of uh, applications. And uh, it requires a lot of hardware resources to, to combine. And uh, that's one thing that the automation is also helpful. And we will see later uh, what I mean by that. It also requires a CMake and a proper uh, development environment. Uh, the CMake that we have for uh, native uh, development of for Amiga was for this quite old. Uh, I don't, I doubt that it is useful for any project. So this kind of uh, ports uh, require to have a, a cross compiling development environment. Uh, otherwise, it is quite difficult to make it work on your uh, system. Sometimes I had for much smaller projects to just ignore to make and to create uh, my own make files. Uh, manually or by using the cold pens, which is a, an excellent application. So, uh, I was thinking, when I started this project, I was thinking how this development environment should uh, work. And um, I wanted to have something that uh, it could be generic for other projects to be used and be able to be extended um, if necessary. Uh, so, if someone wants to create their own uh, solution, they could get my solution and then extend it, adding their own stuff that would be useful for them. Uh, it should also be shared. And by that, I don't mean that having something like it is, uh, I don't know, 10 gigabytes or 20 gigabytes of uh, a file, a virtual machine or something like that. And, wait for hours to, to download and set up on your machine. Uh, it should be shareable, uh, easily shareable, even if it could be uh, some text file that would set up that uh, environment on your system. Um, crucial was also to be able to be used in uh, the whole development cycle. I mean, uh, by using that for the development, changing your code, Committing your code and then use that to combine your application locally or on any other system, uh, for example, on uh, servers that we can have on the, on the cloud. Um, also, it could be used to test your system, uh, your combined application, if it is possible. Also, that these applications that we are uh, developing for Amiga OS 4 need an Amiga OS 4 uh, setup, right? Uh, but some things might be able to be tested if you are using uh, native code. For example, the when I was working with the JavaScript core, uh, one of the first steps was to be able to have the tool chain to compile it natively for Linux. And that uh, could run some tests. Um, the development environment should also include all the necessary tools and uh, be able to, to use it out of the box. It should provide all uh, the GCC, for example, all the latest SDK and the header files and everything. And also uh, be able the build uh, part of it to, to, to work as a guide for everyone who would like to make their own. Uh, see what exactly the, are the steps that someone followed, that I followed to create that development environment. And if someone needs to go and make changes on that, be able to do it and 
create their own solution. Uh, it should be fa as fast as possible, because uh, especially for the web kit, uh, on my system here, that is a laptop uh, that I have for the last uh, 12 years, uh, it takes more than 20 minutes to combine uh, up to the level that I combine right now. And uh, you need to have a, a fast solution. Um, also, crucial for me and mandatory is uh, that this development environment doesn't um, strict the developers uh, on specific uh, uh, operating systems and platform. Um, so it should work on every major uh, operating system like uh, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS, and be able to uh, support different uh, architectures, uh, civic architectures, like the AMD and the uh, ARM64. Uh, some people, especially for the ARM64, came to me and asked uh, to make that uh, support because they like to use their uh, Mac uh, computers with uh, the M1 and M2 um, CPUs. So, what else can we use in, uh, except Docker to, to solve this, uh, all these problems? Uh, in my opinion, uh, it is the best tool out there for having all these uh, uh, features and uh, it gives even more. Uh, you can run Docker on any uh, setup and you can run Docker on uh, the cloud uh, if you want to use it uh, for any purpose. And for us, I use it for the CICD processes that uh, I set up. Actually, uh, last week I was on uh, the Amita 58 and uh, Bill uh, contacted me saying that AI of streams uh, doesn't work for GPUs or something like that. And I needed to test it on my Mac uh, computer that I had uh, with me. Uh, I had Python installed, but it was asking for something like the XC run to, to be installed and just to work. And uh, I tried to install it, and uh, that uh, required Xcode to be installed on my machine and download more than 4 gigabytes of uh, uh, software that I would never use and uh, I didn't need. Uh, the solution for that, instead of doing that, uh, was to install Docker and with a 100 megabyte of uh, Docker image, I had Python running on my system uh, in no time. And uh, things like that is that make Docker uh, quite useful for me, and uh, if I wanted, I could uh, expand it and use, use it as I uh, would like on any machine. Um, and also, Docker has a huge community that uh, is using it, so it's always getting better, faster. The latest version, versions of uh, Docker is quite fast, uh, and it's getting better and better. Um, so, what I have, if I, the, the main idea about Docker is that you should be able to build it, share it, and run it everywhere. So, I have here some uh, links uh, in my presentation and I would like to show you about that. The first is, uh, both of the, the, the top two are from my GitHub and are the uh, code that I have uh, for building the uh, token. You see that this is WebKit on Docker. This is the one that I use to combine WebKit uh, and we will see that in a demo later. And here we have uh, a Docker file. The Docker file is a script that you describe what exactly you want to install inside the Docker image. Think about the Docker image like a hard disk for the virtual machine that is called the Docker container. So you can go and choose another uh, Docker image and extend it. Uh, to add your own stuff in there. For this one, I use the Amiga TCC on Docker, another uh, Docker image that I implement, and this is, if this one has the specific tag, tags are for um, labeling different versions of the same image. 
So you can have a title that has a TCC 11, you can have a title that has TCC 8, you can have whatever you want. So someone can get this image and extend it. And that's what exactly I'm doing here. I get that, that image that I'm going to show you later, and extend it for this specific uh, project, which is the YFT uh, port, to include in there some extra applications, like the Bit Essentials, the new tool, and also to install some extra libraries that I need. Um, you can, these uh, commands are created, uh, the, they are simple uh, bus commands that you can do on any uh, terminal. Hey George, can you make so the font a little bit bigger? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, and because this, uh, these images are based on uh, Ubuntu, you use have to get to install them, to install the packages, and uh, then I'm doing some uh, here to download the packages and install them in the uh, OS for SDK path. Um, and that will build the image that I need to uh, to use for the WebKit port. If we go to the next one, this is a more complicated uh, setup because I have in this code two different images. One is for the base always for a uh, setup which has the which I use to combine the GC. Combiner and uh, set up the library C and all this stuff. So here I have our score. I have again a Docker file which uh, clones uh, some uh, Git repositories that has to do with the art tools, that has to do with the bin utils, everything, call utils, and all this stuff. And then I installed some extra uh, software. And after that, I copy this, uh, the repositories inside the uh, image and start uh, executing the compilation of the atoms. Which, as you can see here, I have a script which I'm executing. And that script is exactly at this point, combine add tools. And that has all the commands that I need to uh, install and uh, to combine the add tools. And what that exactly does at the end, um, combines add tools and saves them in a specific folder. Uh, so if you are on your uh, Linux machine and you want to uh, Compile that to yourself, you're going to do pretty much the same uh, steps. And that's, that's why Docker is so powerful on that because you have already there the, the scripts and whatever you need to, to do. Uh, there were some situations where we needed to uh, override some files inside the compilation, that's why I'm doing some uh, override of files like the Amiga OS page or the configure to do uh, different things with the compilation uh, because uh, in our team we were uh, investigating other solutions or we um, well, wanted to try something different so with uh, a docker you can do that. Uh, and it is also one of the benefits that you can experiment without breaking your uh, development environment. If you want create a different development environment on your local machine, you can do it without messing with the main development environment that you have. Um, and with these files here, I can combine whichever uh, GC version I, I need. I have a make file uh, that helps me with some uh, uh, parameters, and I can say that I want to combine GC8 or GC11, and that pulls down the, the necessary repositories and starts building that. So if I do docker, uh, sorry, make build GCC11, it will start combining GCC11. 
Uh, that's why I'm using the make files because uh, they are uh, quite uh, useful for that. Um, to simplify some parameters and things like that. And also, I have here a different make file and a different Docker file, as you can see, because this is focused mostly to create the SDK part of the images. You have the PPC, uh, GCC, and uh, all this stuff, the albums installation, the library C installation, and you also need to have some extra uh, libraries. And that, what does is creating some environment variables. Uh, for example, I have an environment variable that is the SDK path. And then run, here I, I run a, a link of a file to, to somewhere else. For example, I, I link the BBC Amiga OS AS to user bin AS, if you want to, to use it like that. And then I set up a user, a specific user inside the, the Docker image, which is called Amidev. This is necessary so that we can keep uh, the same permissions from the host system that is my main computer and the system inside the container so that uh, you can edit, change, whatever you want to do in the files from both sides. Uh, otherwise, inside the container, this would be uh, used by the root uh, user and you couldn't edit these files outside the container. And um, also, I set up some extra tools. These are scripts in here, set up tools, extra tools that I need. Python 3, Python 2.7, and some other stuff. And also, I have this script that uh, gets the SDK, uh, copies uh, some uh, needed files from there, creates some links that are needed to um, uh, specific libraries from the CLIP2 to go to new lib so that they are available on both sides. This is something that happens on the native SDK as well. Uh, so, uh, this is necessary. And also installed other uh, libraries like, like the uh, SDL, SDL2, CL4ES, and so on, a lot of libraries. The, the point for that is that the user is going to get that uh, Docker image, start it, install it, start it, and uh, won't need to, to install other libraries. Uh, of course, I haven't included everything, uh, this is something that I want to do in the, in the future, but for most of the uh, applications, of the, the, the development applications that I used and people used, this is uh, quite complete. Now, if a library is missing, you can easily do, uh, install it, and download it from uh, the OS 40 port, and copy all the files inside the SDK folder. Um, and that's the way that I get the, the images. The other good thing that you have uh, with these images is that, let's say that you, your system is a Ubuntu uh, system, or a Linux system, and you don't want to build everything, but you also don't want to uh, use Docker uh, for the development part. You can run these uh, images to run a container, create a, a volume between the host machine and the container itself, and go and grab all the folders with all these uh, applications, with the GC and everything, and copy them into your uh, own machine. And then you can have them uh, running on your machine natively, if you want, and uh, use it without using the uh, So that's the way that I build the, the Docker images, and then there is a way to serve them. All these images are available on the hub.docker.com. Uh, uh, for example, the, the web kit uh, on Docker is here, with the latest uh, being built two months ago. You can see that it supports both of the CPU architectures, 
And there are different uh, types for different versions of that. Uh, what that means is that if you have Docker on your machine with a simple uh, command, you can uh, download it and start using it. And we will see on the demo later how exactly this can be done. This is Amiga GC on Docker. So this is something that is a little bit over one gigabyte of uh, uh, file size. Um, on your system, but this is downloaded because this is a gzip archive. Uh, on your system, uh, it's going to be a little bit more than two gigabytes. Have in mind that uh, the gc add tools are quite big, uh, and that includes also the uh, operating system that is inside the, uh, the uh, image, Docker image, and the extra uh, applications that we need, like make, like uh, simulate, and all the stuff that we need to, to make, uh, to, to combine anything you will need. And of course, the SDK. So with that, uh, you have everything in one uh, container. So this is also the way to share the, the images that someone doesn't need to go and build uh, the Docker images uh, himself. You can uh, download from there and we will see how exactly this can be done. And also on uh, our WebKit, which is the name of the WebKit port that we uh, developed, we have a wiki page where uh, we describe, I describe all the steps that someone, someone can uh, follow to start building a WebKit on uh, his machine. So I'm going to uh, demonstrate that. Uh, if you like, so it is a time for demo. Please let me know if you see this um, terminal. Yes. Yep, we see it. Perfect. So if I go to, uh, I'm here in the development folder. I'm going to create a, uh, a folder named demos. And then I'm going to go here and grab, let me see, and do a WebKit. I will clone the repository. Um, for having that a little bit faster, I'm going to go on the on depth one. So what I'm doing is we have the repository for uh, the WebKit that we develop, right? So our uh, team is developing this uh, port. We have uh, all the changes over there. And someone would like to contribute somehow or uh, help with some errors that we might uh, have. Uh, instead of going and building uh, his own environment just to test something uh, and messing around, we have uh, the development environment already. And I will show you uh, in a second how exactly this can be done. If you have any questions, please let me know. So, as you can see, right now I'm cloning the the code in uh, my local machine. Okay, I haven't started anything like a container or anything uh, like a virtual machine. So that means that if I go and do something like open the, my VS Code, here you see already the, the folder that is created, and we can have uh, the, the code available at this point. Not needed. Okay. And this is a good example because um, I will show you how exactly you can change things on the code and how you can uh, uh, see them reflected inside the container and actually how we can use it inside the container. So 
It's almost there. I know, Stephen, that you are using a uh, docker. Is that uh, right? Is anyone else uh, using docker from the from the floor? Yeah, the uh, ZKSG team is using docker. Yeah, I use it from time to time. I'm using Stephen's uh, docker. Um, uh, <laughs> Instructions uh, described in the Docker file. How can someone create their own environment? Because, uh, to be honest with you, uh, not everyone likes uh, Docker. But at least you have somewhere documented what exactly they need to do to set up their uh, development environment in a way that it should work just fine um, and don't have issues like, uh, okay, my Ubuntu is the latest one. You created the documentation for Ubuntu 16 and it doesn't work right now, what I do, and things like that. So, as you can see, the uh, visual code, I have already all the files here. But uh, let's see how we can start combining. Uh, if I do a test here, I have a folder. And the only thing that I need to do is to get this, uh, this line of code. And that's exactly what uh, anyone would like uh, to uh, would need to do if they want to develop or combine the web tool. So what I have here is uh, I hope that it is visible for everyone. Uh, Docker run uh, with a specific name. I create here a specific volume, which is the folder that I'm writing now, and that is assigned to this folder inside the container. And I set this folder as a workspace. So whenever I get inside the container, that is the first folder that I'm going to, to visit. And you see here, I have the uh, Docker image that I need, which is the WebKit on Docker, which is exactly this one here. And the last is the command that I want to, to execute. So when I do that, you see that here I say it changes to uh, it says I have root access in a specific uh, system, uh, and that's the idea of the Docker uh, container that I that was created. This uh, part was done uh, quite fast because I already uh, have this image on my system. Um, the first thing that I need to do is to change the user uh, to Amida. This user has the group ID and user ID of uh, 1000, and that matches the user that I'm using on uh, the host machine. So if I look here, you see that the WebKit folder that was created outside the container has uh, the same user that I'm using inside the container. And that's how you match the permissions between the host and the uh, container. So the only thing that I need to do is we, we, uh, clone the, to go inside the folder and execute this command. So get into the folder, 
execute this. Okay. Execute the next one. These commands are for the Daphne library that we need to have because uh, CMake always has this uh, libdl. Uh, it's mandatory, so we have a Daphne libdl uh, to, to use. And then we use the make uh, file and this command to start uh, compiling the JavaScript uh, core for Amiga OS. Already started CMake. You have everything described in, you see here, the started building. Uh, and you have everything combined in the make file here, which executes this exactly uh, job. So, as you can see, with uh, couple of uh, easy commands. Uh, someone can start providing anything uh, they want. So if I go, let's say, to here and add something at the top, remember this folder is on my host machine. I see the files in my host machine. And if I go inside here and see, say, nano uh, uh, make file, sorry. You see that the change that I did from outside the container is already uh, reflected. That means that we can use whatever application you like to use to uh, develop. It is VS Code or anything else that you, you prefer. And that is, uh, whatever change you are doing is automatically reflected inside the container. And the container can be used just to combine uh, your applications. So if I uh, exit, By doing this uh, simple commands, everyone can uh, have a uh, Docker image, a uh, Docker container that can be used to develop, right? And um, what I also like to do is I'm using some extra uh, some extra modules for the VS Code that help me be more productive on the work that I'm doing. So VS Code has a good uh, uh, integration of, uh, uh, of uh, Docker. And you can have, let me see if I can. You can have things like uh, a bar, uh, the sidebar showing different uh, Docker containers that you are using and uh, attached to a new one, sorry, like that. And what it, that does exactly is to, to get inside the container. This is uh, the container that I was using uh, last night uh, to try and combine the spotlights uh, that uh, uh, Stephen showed yesterday and uh, Jamie at the salt out there in the boat. Uh, 2.3 is mentioned. So as I uh, created, I got <coughs> this, uh, uh, this code, I cloned the, the, the repository, and I tried to, to uh, combine it. So let me see here what I have. I have a folder B that I created. Okay, let me remove everything. Now, whatever I'm doing, I am inside the Docker container. Okay. So, as you can see here, I have Amiga. I got in there uh, on this container, so the, this ID is uh, different. And uh, uh, yesterday I used the command, which might not be the, the right one, but I use the command, this command here. 
to do the compilation. Okay, that created the make files. And we do make, and that started uh, building the uh, spotless. So whenever you want to uh, work on a, a project, you just need a couple of clicks uh, inside VS Code and uh, start working with that. Um, also, I like to use a few uh, specific uh, modules in there, and that is useful whenever you are using something like a linter or a daily sense. These are uh, useful for you to, to find the correlation between uh, methods and uh, go straight to the code that you need. And this is better to, to be done inside the container because all the tools are there. Uh, I have um, tools that have to do with uh, tasks or uh, kidlets that uh, help a lot with the git uh, commands to to see the branches and push the code and all this stuff, if, if you need. Uh, as you can see, the, the code uh, compiled, the spot list. And I have here, uh, where is it, spot list? Yes, this is the, the binary. So with uh, uh, using the uh, Docker, you can combine almost everything because uh, they are uh, already available. The SDK is, uh, is there, the libraries that you might need is there, you just need to go and uh, combine it without setting up anything else. Any questions on, so far? Will you be talking about continuous integration, George? Yes, that's the next topic. So, I, I have a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, how do you move your files from your development environment to your target Amiga environment? Like if okay. you to binary, how do you get it from your dev environment over? But, 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 okay. Good question. Uh, actually, because this code is uh, shared with my host machine, Okay, for example, the, the spotless that I uh, provided just a minute ago. If I go to the folder that I have that, which is here, here, I have a folder that says spotless, and inside build, I have the files here that I just combined. So, and because my user has the same permissions like the user inside the container, I can use them. It's, they are, I can delete them, I can copy them, and usually, what I'm doing is, that's my personal preference, of course. Uh, I have my NAS uh, server here in my home. I copy them into a beta folder. And then uh, using my Amiga, I go there by FTP and grab all the files, and then I test them. I also do the same thing by running, uh, if I want to test something fast, by running QMU on my system here, again with FTP, and um, give a quick test of the, the code if I need. Of course, there are different uh, solutions out there, like uh, have running uh, an FTP server on your uh, Amiga OS, and uh, send the files automatically there. You can do it as well. Sorry, George, what, what did you just do there to get over your um, Amiga screen? I this started. is the, I, I started the QMU. Uh, ah, okay, the thanks. Part. So I have here uh, the AMI FTP, and from that, I connect to my NAS uh, server, and I have there uh, all the better things that I would like to, to test. I don't know if that answers your uh, question. Yes, Say yes. Yeah, is that directed to me? Uh, speak. speak. Yes. If yeah. you have any other questions, anyone, please let me know. Huh? That answers this question. 
Great. Um, just you sir? Yes. Um, I'm just curious on your QMU uh, setup. What does the network interface look like from your host machine to, to QMU? Uh, let me um, show you exactly. Uh, I've only had luck taking and in getting into uh, to a host. Yes. I'm using only. Uh, I'm using. Let me see. Okay. Increase it. No. I'm using. This is the line that I'm using right now. Um, I'm emulating an 81 RTL uh, card. This uh, gives you access uh, to your. Uh, to network uh, above the uh, network that the host machine has. But also, as you can see here, I have a host forward on TCP for this port. Uh, this was uh, some test that I was doing some time ago to be able to send commands uh, inside the Docker container. Sorry, inside the emulated Amiga host. And there are some applications that I, I was uh, investigating back then um, that you can go uh, from the host machine and the terminal and execute stuff inside the emulated Amiga, which is quite useful if you, for example, get something from FTP. If you want to execute a script that gets files, <coughs> sorry, changes permissions, and uh, push them somewhere else, if you want. Right. So what the, uh, the IP address inside of your uh, OS4 emulation is I, just, <coughs> it's just uh, the local, the local uh, subnet between the, the guest and the host, right? It's not going to the outside getting its own DHCP information. That's, exactly. That's, that's what I'm trying to take you do with, with mine, is to get it to map to the outside. Uh, and uh, and get its own, have its own identity in the network because you're, you know, it's like you're saying you're, you when you run 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 an FTP server um, on inside of OS four and push stuff to it, you know, yeah, uh, which would be very handy to take and do. It's 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 difficult to find because it just doesn't, you know, from another machine, not the host, especially. It's like you know, it doesn't, uh, you can't find it. Yeah, uh, what you can do that. Uh, I agree exactly, uh, absolutely with what you said. This uh, has a network that is above my host machine network, uh, internal network between the host machine and the uh, uh, emulated OS4. If you want to have an FTP running inside your uh, Amiga OS4, you need to host forward this uh, the, the port. The port for uh, FTP is 21. So if you use something like 22, 21 on uh, your local machine and 21 on in, uh, the emulated, uh, you can use from uh, the host machine 5Z or something else and uh, point to that port, the 22, 21 on your local host. And that will work um, connecting to, your, to the emulated Amiga. Because actually, if you go on your local host on specific port, that uh, QMU uh, connects to the emulator. Right, yeah. I, I did experiment with that uh, some taking in the uh, ports forward into it. Uh, but for my testing, I was really trying to get it to be on the side. I mean, this, this, is, it, this is a QMU thing, it's, it's not a host port thing. You know, just, no, it's just, 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 just curious what how, how you had yours running on there. It's, very, it's the same way I've got it on there. So. Yeah, so. but uh, from my side, instead of setting up all this stuff, of course, this is useful if you want to automate some things. I mean, you combine something and uh, automatically goes to your emulated Amiga and then you run it uh, automatically. For example. Uh, I didn't want to, to do that yet because sometimes I uh, fire up the emulated Amiga or I want to be able to grab it from my real Amiga uh, hardware. So I prefer to have something on the uh, local NAS, which is pretty fast. And 
you don't lose, it's a couple of clicks more, but you don't lose uh, too much time. But of course, this is uh, the preference of uh, anyone in the internet. It's not something that I'm saying that you should do that way, <laughs> of course. No, so, the, uh, the, 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 on the Docker stuff, I just wanted to say I like the idea of using a make file to kick off the Docker itself. That's the only complaint I really have about, about Docker when you're trying to, you know, do a build as a single instance, not, not the interactive mode where you were, you were using. Um, that's preferable because you stay in it and keep building all the time. But uh, if you're just kicking off a single single build, you know, I've got like really long alias springs that I <laughs> to do it instead mm -hmm. of typing all of that stuff. But, but the idea of using a make file, just making it a target, you know, that, that's just pretty, uh, pretty slow. I can do something like that. Actually, with Docker, you can do something like uh, that. Git clone, for example, and do Docker build. Right. And from that, you have, uh, let me see where I have it. Uh, if I go to what here, I have a Docker file in this repository. So with Docker build, you execute this Docker file, and that does run everything uh, at this point. It, you have the the repository already cloned, and that fires up and builds uh, the the work import. Or if you want your project. You can do it this way. And that exports everything in a specific folder that you uh, provide, build states. And that is shared with your host system. So if you want to have just a command to compile everything, everything you can do it in a Docker file inside your repository. You execute that, and you have the uh, result in the folder. And then you can say that, OK, I include that process inside the script. And when this is combined, I take the files and send them anywhere. Or I create a, a package and that, then I release that package anywhere. Cool. Docker gives you that uh, opportunity. It gives you the, the tools to do something like that. I'll go to the next one. Thanks. So since we are talking about scripts, my beloved uh, topic also is automation and specific about uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment. Continuous integration is about when you are talking, when you are working on a team with different people and you have Ryan doing some uh, commits and breaks everything. That's great. How are you going to find out that Ryan broke everything? <laughs> you. When they want to create a pull request, you can have something that runs automatically and does all the compilations, and you see that it fails or not. And you can get a report on what happened exactly, why it failed, or if everything goes fine. And that's the simplest way to do it. Uh, this is the, it is also useful if you have the ability to run some tests. Uh, you can run the test uh, during this automation and see that everything is fine before you continue and do the continuous deployment, which is create automatically a release and give it to, to people. Uh, I'm using that uh, with IK, for example, and whenever I create a, a new release tag, uh, I do all the uh, for my lessons for uh, Morphos, OS4, and Capital Street. And I create automatically all the archives. And then I do, as a final step, the deployment where I push the, the archive to uh, Abinet, to OS4 Depot, and to the repository uh, on GitHub. So in, in less than one minute, Everything, things that you should do manually, everything is done uh, automatically. And that for the WebKit, for me, is uh, necessary because um, we want to test latest changes to see if it's fails. It might work just fine on my system, but uh, I might have done some difference 
uh, changes in the, the SDK, for example, which is not reflected inside the development environment, so the compilation fails. I need to update the development environment in such a situation. Um, and that happens even if, I, if one person uh, works on the project or multiple persons are working on the project. And that's the power of uh, this integration. Also, uh, in the future, let's say that we have the first browser, you know, and you want to create automatically uh, nightly builds based on the changes that you are doing. This uh, process of having automatic uh, integration, a CICD and everything, is um, quite useful uh, to do that because it's scripts that you uh, execute at any time. Uh, and also, uh, you can use, bit, uh, use fast and powerful machines uh, to build your system. Right now, we are using uh, servers on uh, the AWS uh, with uh, a lot of CPU uh, and a lot of uh, memory, but we are also able to scale it up if we need more power. And uh, this is the code that I'm using uh, for the, uh, to set up this uh, CICD, uh, which is a YAML file, as you can see. It's not that big. And what exactly it does is setting up the pipeline and uh, wakes up the instances on AWS whenever I go to the a big OS branch and I create a pull request or push something or I create a type. So ex uh, executes that command. You will see that here it uses an image, which is exactly uh, what we are using uh, Docker for. So this pipeline is using uh, an image from uh, Docker Hub. Uh, and below that, after the system is uh, wake up, uh, I clone the repository. I use my image, again, the one that we use to develop. I'm doing exactly the same commands that we saw earlier in the terminal. And also, I have a second step to uh, compile the FFmpeg uh, part uh, for the web team, which also uses the same image. And to show you how this looks like, I will not run it right now, but to show you how it looks like is um, if you go to our repository, there is this badge that shows if the last bit was successful or not. If you click on that, you can see the CICD environment that we have. And those are the, the last uh, uh, jobs that we run. You see how many fail and how many are running. And uh, if you click one of them, you will see all the steps in that uh, CICD process. And here is the clone, here is the compilation of the JavaScript code. You get all the logs uh, for what happened and if that was success successful or not. And the compilation of the FFMBank. If that is not successful, you will have something like that, which fails somewhere. Or let's see if I have a better one. Yeah, here. That the compilation of uh, JavaScript core failed. And uh, that, uh, that with this uh, file, with this simple file and the setup that we have for the uh, uh, continuous integration, you can uh, have this running whenever you set it up to run a pull request or later if we have everything done we can say that whenever we create a new bug make a release of a new browser and share it with anyone uh, Do you have any questions about that? Of course you can use uh, GitHub Actions if you want to implement something similar and GitHub Actions or Bitbucket uh, Automation or uh, most of these uh, Git uh, environments have 
exactly the same image that we use for development. Uh, so the challenges from my side was uh, for, for creating the development environment is to understand what exactly is needed. And that was not something that I sit down and say, okay, what we need, let's write it down. It took a lot of time. Um, we were seeing uh, while we were developing the working how, what exactly is needed, and then I had to update the development environment. Uh, also, the, one of the challenges is to automate the bits for the Tokyo images, because even for building the Tokyo images and uh, having them available in the Tokyo Hub, I have uh, automation that is done whenever I push something into this, uh, uh, sorry, into this uh, repositories. I have, uh, you will see here, the automation to build these uh, containers. And right now I have uh, two machines in the AWS just to do the uh, build of different versions for different architectures. Uh, a graph to give you an idea how this is working is here. So I had to build something that uh, if we do changes, Let's automate the, the way that these are built and uh, populated and shared in Tokyo Hub. Um, during we, the, the development of the, the board, which is not finished yet, we were doing some changes that Ryan is going to talk to you in a few minutes that had to do with the GCC, different changes with libraries, and I had to have. Uh, a development environment updated so that I can move on with the development or uh, experiment with uh, different uh, uh, solutions. And of course, uh, as I said earlier, people asked about the R64 support and I had to, to, to make it happen. Future plans. Um, for me, is to make the Docker images set up simpler. I change a, a lot on the way the, the Docker files are and I'm trying to split it in different files so that it's easier for someone to arrive and we'll show you later. And uh, the reason for that is that we need to have something to test all the experimental things that we have uh, available. And also anyone else who would like to, to test it uh, and find possible uh, fails, failures uh, to be able to do it easily. And of course include more libraries as needed. So, what to remember, uh, Tokyo is a tool for unified cross compiling environment. You can run in whatever, whenever you want, uh, from your desktop machine to the, the cloud. Uh, it is available today, so you can go and grab it and use it. Uh, it can be used in multiple projects. I know that a couple of uh, developers used it to port some uh, new uh, games for Amiga OS 4 recently. And uh, it is an easy way to experiment without breaking your system. Uh, think about having your Ubuntu system, uh, your local uh, machine, and uh, spend hours to set up your uh, environment, and then you want to test another library C or change um, the GCC that you have or whatever. Uh, it is a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, with uh, Docker, you can just create a different image create a new container and we have that uh, ready to, to run on the, on the same code base that you want to test it. Uh, for example, I have different uh, Docker images and I uh, test them with a WebKit uh, port. And uh, anyone is able to get involved in WebKit port with a little bit set up from their side and on their uh, system. And that was my uh, presentation. I hope that it was interesting to you, and I hope that it would take less time, but I'm sorry about that. <laughs> if you have any questions or whatever, uh, please let me know, and afterwards you can contact me at any time, and I will help you understand anything on this uh, Docker images and use it yourself. Thank you very much. No, no, no.
Yes. Okay, yeah. So, so, so the, you know, the, the concept of continuous integration interested me quite a lot there. And um, I, I do actually wonder if it actually opens the door a little bit for development in Amiga OS in general. Um, we've heard a lot of people say things like, um, you know, we're stuck in eternal betas. That if you're not a beta tester, you're basically not going to have the latest stuff. Well, you know, and you're waiting for years and years to think, well, no, you know, that's an exaggeration. Well, maybe it isn't. Um, you're waiting a long time for the latest library to come out, which you need. And I, I just wonder sometimes with the continuous integration concept whether or not um, it would, of course, require someone who does have access, better access, and all the latest stuff somewhere to serve the machine. Um, but I do wonder if it's possible that people who don't have the fortune of being a beta tester would be able to say, okay, I've created a test. I don't have access to the latest stuff. I'd like to know whether or not my test would work in the event that I did have the latest stuff, the stuff that's going to be released in a year's time. So what I'll do is I'll create a test. Uh, or I'll at least give the source code over to that per to the to a continuous integration server that is owned by the person that has all the latest stuff and say, so, hey, when you compile this and link this with all the latest stuff, do you get the expected results that I also pass to you? So for example, saying um, when this test runs, I expect this to come out in standard out um, or standard error or something like that and sort of do some sort of comparison. So what that means then is that the person creating a test doesn't get the doesn't get a, doesn't get the binary that's returned because of course in that binary is linked code that he doesn't have access to, but instead that the continuous integration server can run it, uh, compare the test results and say, hey, by the way, in the event that you did have these libraries that are coming out in the future, your test would pass. So I, I just say again now whether or not it would open the door to people who don't have better access to be able to do some sort of futuristic testing to figure out, yeah, you know what, this is in the right direction. Uh, you know, so I, 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 just, I just wonder about that. Mm. Uh, yeah, this uh, could happen, and I like that kind of questions. Uh, you, I can't include in this uh, document as things that are not public, available, uh, because anyone who could uh, pull that image instantly has access to these uh, files. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, let, 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 me just, let me just make it more clear what I meant. Um, I'm not talking about someone pulling a Docker image down. I'm talking about you, for example, having a Jenkins server in your own house um, where you could run the program. Now, obviously, you know, I don't think Jenkins is native to Amiga OS 4 or Amiga OS 4.4, but let's, let's say that you, on the Jenkins server, that you would configure it so that it would run the test through QEMU and um, so that the guy would be able to say, oh yeah, my test passed, actually. But it was your Jenkins server that you're serving, and he's not getting access to anything that actually he's not allowed to know. He's only getting access to whether or not his test passed. Uh, it, just, it was yeah. just something passing that I thought, and uh, it was just something to get excited about, potentially, uh, about the continuous integration topic that you brought up there. As I said earlier, the QMO is able to be uh, accessed outside uh, the emulated environment from your host machine. So easily you can say, okay, uh, I execute inside the QMU uh, a command that grabs the binaries from there and uh, from anywhere and uh, executes them and gives me the fails or not. And that can be seen from the host machine. So you can run uh, in the continuous integration a headless QMU version of Amiga Oxford and run code in there and see if that uh, returns something or trails. Uh, yeah. in, the, in theory, this is, uh, I think it is quite simple to, to be done. Uh, I haven't done that, it's something that I would like to test sometime. sometime. Uh, I have found the tools that is uh, possible to, to do something like that. Uh, now, if that person doesn't have access uh, to the latest stuff, but if he has access to a repository and create a pull request that initiates that uh, pipeline uh, for CICD that gets a Docker image that is private and runs on specific server who, where this person doesn't have access. It is pretty uh, uh, secure that you are not going to, to uh, share things that shouldn't be shared. Uh, because it runs somewhere where he doesn't have access. And then, uh, instantly, when that finishes, 
in the repository, you will see if that failed or not. Yeah, okay, that was good, thanks, yeah. But yeah, running a QMU inside a, a pipeline, that is an interesting topic that we should uh, investigate more. Any question from other West or I lost you completely? Anybody no, we're here. still here. <laughs> we're listening, <laughs> cool. listening anxious. <laughs> no questions. No questions? Cool. No. So if, if you want to, to create anything, and develop anything, use it cross provider on every machine, please consider uh, .NET. Thanks everyone. Thanks George. Thanks George. Thanks for all the work. Thanks again. On that, this is uh, really what uh, I was looking for to kind of get back up to the state of the art <laughs> with the uh, new development. So thanks a lot.